Hi guys, um, my name is Caitlin. My name is Chris. My name is Tina. And we're dietetic interns at Stony Brook University Hospital. Today's presentation will be focusing on heart health promotion. I want to start by briefly discussing Stony Brook Medicine's Healthy Libraries program to give you an overview of the resources provided for you through this program. The Stony Brook Medicine Healthy Libraries program provides access to both in-person and virtual healthcare related resources for the public library patrons throughout Suffolk County. The program is supported in part by the American Heart Association of Long Island. The goal of this program is to provide evidence-based health information, promote access to local health and social service programs, and provide resources for librarians and their patrons. So once this presentation is completed, you will all be able to understand the anatomy, biological functions, and structure of the cardiac and pulmonary system, understand the various ways heart disease manifests and the factors that contribute to its development, create heart-healthy meals that are easy to make and affordable, remember the key elements of the DASH diet and other healthy lifestyle interventions, identify results of relevant cardiovascular lab values to assess heart health, Summarize cardiovascular risk factors, relevant lab values, and current guidelines of a heart-healthy lifestyle, and understand how to read a food label and be able to apply knowledge of labels when selecting foods. In today's presentation, we will be learning more about heart disease and discussing uncontrollable risk factors, controllable risk factors, contributing conditions, and cholesterol. We will finish by reviewing the main takeaways from this presentation. So we will first start by defining heart disease. Heart disease, which is also known as cardiovascular disease, refers to multiple types of heart conditions that relate to the heart and blood vessels. Two of the most common heart disease conditions are a heart attack and stroke. Other types of heart disease conditions include high blood pressure, chest pain, poor circulation, and abnormal heartbeat. Unfortunately, heart disease has a high prevalence rate in the United States. According to the CDC, one person dies every 37 seconds in the U.S. from CBD. There are both controllable risk factors, uncontrollable risk factors, and controllable risk factors for heart disease. Uncontrollable risk factors are factors in your life that you are unable to change. For example, heart disease may run in your family, making you genetically predisposed to it. It is important to be aware of anyone in your family, especially your mother or father, has a history of heart disease so that you can take preventative measures to lower your risk. Another uncontrollable risk factor includes ethnicity. Certain ethnicities such as, such as African Americans, Mexican Americans, Native American, Hawaiians, and some Asian Americans are at higher risk for heart disease. Other uncontrollable risk factors include men over 45 years old, women over 55 years old, and postmenopausal women. LDL cholesterol, also known as bad cholesterol, typically rises in the body postmenopause. Although you can't control these factors, you can decrease your risk through lifestyle modifications for controllable risk factors. Controllable risk factors are factors that you can change and or control. For example, current tobacco users are at the highest risk for heart disease. However, the risk begins to decline after quitting. Another controllable risk factor is an unhealthy eating pattern. A diet that is high in saturated fat and low in fruits and vegetables puts you at risk, puts you at a higher risk for heart disease. You can control this by increasing your fruits and vegetables, consuming less saturated fats, such as red meats and fried foods, and choosing whole grains. Other controllable risk factors include lack of physical activity, heavy drinking, and stress. It is important to incorporate physical activity into your daily lifestyle limit alcohol consumption, and reduce stress to decrease your risk of heart disease. Ways to reduce stress can include yoga, meditation, journaling, and deep breathing. In addition to uncontrollable and controllable risk factors, there are certain conditions that can contribute to heart disease, including chronic inflammation, diabetes, being overweight or obese, and high blood pressure. Chronic inflammation is most often due to diet and lifestyle. You can reduce chronic inflammation by making healthy diet changes and increasing physical activity. Diabetes can also contribute to heart disease. High blood sugar can damage blood vessels and the nerves that control your heart over time. 
Controlling your diabetes with a carbohydrate-controlled diet can help reduce your risk of heart disease. Additionally, losing weight if you are overweight or obese can help boost heart function. Lastly, high blood pressure damages arteries that can become blocked and prevent blood flow to the heart muscle. This can weaken the heart over time, leading to chest pain and increase the risk of heart attack. You can decrease blood pressure by making changes to the controllable risk factors we discussed before. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about cholesterol. So total cholesterol is the measure of all the different types of cholesterol that's in your body. HDL or high density lipoproteins are considered to be the good cholesterol, whereas LDL is considered to be the bad cholesterol. When levels of LDL are too high, it can cause deposits to form on the blood vessel walls. This is called plaque. Eventually, too much plaque can cause atherosclerosis, which is demonstrated uh, over on the image on the right. So you can see uh, what happens when you're developing atherosclerosis is a hardening and the narrowing of blood vessels. And hopefully you can see my, uh, my cursor over here. But basically the walls of this blood vessel here are starting to form plaque. You can see this white mass over on the sides here. And so what that's doing is you see the red blood cells going through the inside of the vessel. And when the vessel is narrowing, it starts to restrict the red blood cells, which are carrying oxygen, uh, from being able to go through it. So now if this clot develops in your heart, it can cause a heart attack. And if it forms in the brain, that can eventually lead to a stroke. So what to look out for with your cholesterol? There are a few different numbers that you might see for cholesterol if you have blood work done at your doctor's office. These numbers can get a little bit confusing, so we're going to break it down in a bit more detail. Total cholesterol, like we mentioned before, is the measure of all of your body's cholesterol. If this number is over 200 milligrams per deciliter, that can place you at an increased risk of heart disease. LDL cholesterol that's over 100 milligrams per deciliter may increase your risk of heart disease. And an HDL cholesterol, now remember HDL is the good cholesterol. We want that to be higher than 40, less than 40 milligrams per deciliter, and you can have an increased risk for heart disease. And lastly, triglycerides, or essentially the amount of fat that's in your bloodstream, uh, numbers of triglycerides that are over 150 milligrams per deciliter will place you at an increased risk. So now we're going to just do a short activity uh, to see what our own individual risks are for developing heart disease. And while this tool can't replace the care of a doctor or a registered dietitian, it may alert you to things that you should discuss at your next checkup. So hopefully everybody has a pen or a pencil and some writing material next to them. Uh, and they can just take a couple of minutes to go through this activity. Uh, basically, you'll just put a little check mark uh, next to each of the things that you can answer a yes to. You can't answer yes to it, just leave it blank. And then at the end, after question seven, uh, you just add up all of your yes answers, and then we'll multiply that number by four. So hopefully you all were able to get through the whole questionnaire, uh, but basically just add up your scores and then multiply it by four. And the closer that your score is to a 100, uh, that means that your chance of living a long, healthy life free of heart disease is higher. Uh, so your risk for developing heart disease, in other words, would be lower. But don't worry if your score is not where you would like it to be. Next, we're going to be talking about some ways that you can go about increasing this score and helping to improve your overall risk of heart disease. And one of the ways that we are going to do that uh, is that we're going to talk about putting heart healthy eating into practice. One of the best tools that we can use to put heart healthy eating into practice is called Life Simple 7. 
It's created by the American Heart Association. And on the right, you can see the seven steps, which are managing blood pressure, controlling cholesterol, reducing blood glucose, being more active, eating better, lowering your weight if you were overweight, and quitting smoking. So in the next few slides, we're gonna go over some ways to accomplish each of these steps. The first tool to improve our diet is on the back of every single food item that you buy at the grocery store. Yet, despite how common the food label is, it can sometimes be difficult to interpret. Recently, the food label has undergone a few design changes to help make it easier to read. So on the slide, you can see the original label is on the left over here. And then the updated one is over here on the right. So going down the list, we'll see that the servings per container, where did that go? There it is. The servings per container and the serving size are both listed at the top. It's now a little bit easier to spot the serving size, uh, which we can see on this label is two thirds of a cup. All of the amounts below will be for a two third cup serving for this food. We can see that the cal calories are listed at 230 and there are uh, eight grams of fat per serving. Then listed under fat, there is saturated, trans fat, and sometimes you might also see monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fat. So foods with saturated and trans fats should be limited in your diet. But if you see mono and polyunsaturated fats listed, those are the good fats that can help it to improve your cholesterol. Underneath the fat, you'll see cholesterol, and it's best to aim for no cholesterol in the foods that you eat, but all animal products will have some cholesterol. Plant-based foods, on the other hand, will not have any cholesterol. Sodium, which is the next item, uh, preferably you should aim for less than 140 milligrams of sodium per serving. And so everybody shout out, I know it's a little hard to time it, but based on this food label over here, if we're trying to meet 140 milligrams per serving, would this food meet that? Don't everybody yell out at once. Okay, so no, this is not going to uh, meet that criteria. It has 160 milligrams, which is over that. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it should warn you that this food may be something you should consume less often or with a smaller portion. Under the carbohydrate tab, uh, we can find fiber, which we should look to have at least two grams or more of in our carbohydrate rich foods. It's also best to avoid sugar, particularly those added sugars. If the food does contain some sugar, remember to pair it with protein and healthy fats to slow down your digestion. And underneath of that, we can find protein. Remember that protein can help keep you full and reduce blood sugar spikes. And lastly, there are any significant sources of vitamins and minerals listed. So some of the ones that we want in our food will be vitamin D, calcium, and iron. Your doctor may advise you to avoid certain vitamins and minerals, though, if you have certain health conditions, and that would be something you need to discuss with your healthcare provider. So what foods have saturated fats or trans fats? Listed below, there are a number of foods that contain saturated and trans fat. Foods with saturated fats should be limited as much as possible, but trans fats need to be avoided as there is a direct link between trans fat and developing heart disease. Saturated fats will typically be anything containing animal products. Uh, and you can see a number of different meats and dairy products here towards the top of this list. Dairy can be part of a healthy diet, but when you're choosing dairy foods, be sure to choose skim products instead of whole or 2%. The trans fat foods to avoid, which is lower down on the list, will be any shelf stable items such as shortening, fried food, coffee creamer, and surprisingly, even non-natural peanut butter. 
Food companies have a number of ways that they can use these products without it showing up directly on the food label because they will use, use it in very, very small amounts. But if you look under the food label in the ingredients section, if you ever see the word hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, that food is likely to contain some level of trans fat. So the American Heart Association lists a number of guidelines for heart healthy eating. And with the knowledge of food labels, these should be a little bit easier to follow. So the first is eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, which we call the rainbow. I think it's pretty well demonstrated by that picture below. You see there's a lot of different colors uh, and shades in, in that picture. Number two is choosing fiber rich whole grains as often as possible. Three is to choose poultry and fish without skin and prepare them in healthy ways without, add or, without added saturated and trans fats. Also eating lean cuts of meat. Number four is eating a variety of fish at least two times per week. And five is to select low fat, 1% and fat free skim dairy products. Continuing with the guidelines, number six is avoid foods containing partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. Number seven is limiting saturated and trans fats and replacing them with healthy fats. Number eight is to cut back on beverages that contain added sugars. Number nine is to choose low sodium foods and aim to consume mo no more than 2,400 milligrams per day unless otherwise stated by your doctor. And 10 is to drink in moderation. So in addition to the American Heart Association's guidance, another diet has also shown promise in the prevention of heart disease. Called the DASH diet, it stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Results showed that imitating a DASH-like diet in a study can significantly reduce risk for CVD, CHD, stroke, and heart failure by 20%, 21%, 19%, and 29% respectively. This diet is low in saturated fat, red meat, and sugar. It contains high amounts of fruits and vegetables, four to five servings each per day. And it includes whole grains, nuts, lean meat and fish. And the method that this diet uses to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease is that it helps to reduce high blood pressure. So here's an example of what a heart healthy breakfast could look like. Oatmeal made with Greek yogurt layered with berries and almonds, or a 100% whole wheat English muffin topped with a nut butter of your choice and slices of banana. And next up we have lunch and for lunch one example of a heart healthy meal would be a 100% whole wheat wrap packed with shredded carrots for some crunch, creamy guacamole, baked skinless chicken breast for protein, and some dried cranberries for added flavor. Another lunch example would be a nice mixed green salad. We can add our favorite greens, spinach, lettuce, arugula, or a few options, or we can find pre-packaged mixed greens in the produce section of the grocery store. We can top our salad with some sliced almonds, slices of mandarin oranges, and toss it with balsamic dressing. And it can be eaten with a side of tuna salad for a good source of protein, which can be flavored with lemon juice and dried herbs. Now here's a sample menu for dinner. Our first example is a hearty baked dish, skin, uh, sorry, baked skinless chicken breast that's been cubed and seasoned with balsamic vinegar along with any herbs and spices we like. And we can bake the cubed chicken meat with some veggies like asparagus and half of the sweet potato. We can even cube the sweet potato as well to make them cook faster. Another dinner can be a five bean chili made with preferably no sodium canned vegetables. But if you can't find no sodium canned vegetables, then low sodium would be the next best thing. And fresh veggies, which are naturally sodium free are also a great choice. Lastly, we can make dinner fun with a taco night, which includes whole wheat tortillas, sauteed veggies like sweet peppers, corn or beans, such as black or garbanzo beans. Taco night can also include condiments such as guacamole, which is a healthy source of fat and any low fat cheese we like. And I'd also like to mention that if you do find um, a low sodium canned uh, vegetable that before preparing it, 
It also uh, helped to reduce the sodium content. If we add the canned veggies to a strainer and just rinse the vegetables, just to rinse out some extra sodium. Now, what are some recommendations for a heart healthy activity? Some type of formal exercise or physical activity, preferably for about 150 minutes or two and a half hours a week is recommended. Exercise is a very heart healthy activity because it strengthens the heart and lungs. It's recommended to incorporate a combination of strength, strength training, such as lifting or push-ups, anaerobic activities, such as biking, running, or swimming. But most importantly, any form of physical activity for 150 minutes a week will be a great to condition the heart and lungs. Another heart healthy activity is stress management. There are many relaxing activities which can help decrease blood pressure and reduce strain on the heart. The picture at the bottom right lists a few, meditation, deep breaths, being active, spending time with nature, sleeping well, staying socially connected, checking in with your loved ones, eating a nourishing diet, reducing caffeine intake, and staying organized with lists and plans. These are all ways to reduce and manage stress in our lives. Now let's focus on exercise. Here are some ways you can hit that 150 minutes a week recommendation, walking or jogging for 30 minutes, five days a week, walking or jogging for 30 minutes, three days a week, and strength training for 30 minutes, two days a week. We can even change walking or jogging three days a week to two and add in a day of 30 minutes yoga for stretching and balance. Now, these are some big goals and with just about anything, change doesn't happen overnight. So it's very important to start small. We don't want to set ourselves up for failure. Setting smaller and shorter exercise goals at first will be more realistic for us to make it a habit. And from there, once you're comfortable with your formal exercise, you may want to challenge yourself and change your routine. But to make some changes now, some great beginning activities are taking the stairs instead of elevators, parking further away from stores for a longer walk, going on walks with family instead of watching TV, and even walking for a few minutes after meals, play, <laughs> playing sports with family and friends, or going on hikes or nature walks, maybe even setting a goal for a great view. There's also plenty of resources for exercise and stress reduction. For exercise, one resource is the Peloton app. You do not need a Peloton bike to use this app. There's also Swerk It, another app for exercise tutorials. Both apps have many tutorials for all different types of exercises so that they're a great resource to spark any ideas or introduce you to a new form of exercise you haven't tried before. But if you don't want to download anything, going on YouTube and searching for an exercise tutorial that you want to follow along with is also a great option too. For stress reduction, some popular meditation apps are Headspace or Calm. Both resources have meditation playlists that are organized at beginning and advanced levels, whether you want to meditate for shorter or longer. These apps also have a playlist specifically for sleep and stress management. But again, if you don't want to download anything, YouTube is a great resource to find playlists or audio video tutorials as well. So we're almost near the end of our presentation and now we'll go over the main takeaways and wrap it up with a post Poland review. When it comes to heart disease, even with family history and any of the other risk factors discussed, you can still do a lot to lower your risk of heart disease. Small changes to diet and lifestyle can add up and even reducing a few risks can significantly lower your chances of developing heart disease, which leads us to what can you do? We went over how diet and exercise plays a huge component in reducing risk of heart disease. For diet, we want to prioritize whole grains, fruits and vegetables, and be mindful of saturated and trans fats. It's also important to manage and reduce stress, which being physically active can help with. And lastly, if you or someone you know, smokes and are interested in making some of these heart healthy changes, you or someone you know can ask a doctor or healthcare professional about steps towards quitting to, mo to promote a healthy heart and lungs. And we will go over the questions. So now let's go over the correct answers for the poll question. Number one, what is, a con un what is an uncontrollable risk factor for heart disease? The answer is A, family history. 
Number two, what is a controllable risk factor for heart disease? It's going to be D, tobacco use. Fun fact, hypertrichosis is also known as werewolf syndrome. It is an abnormally excessive hair growth, and monooriginosis is a made-up disease. Number three, your LDL levels should be low, and your HDL levels should be high to decrease risk of heart disease. That's going to be D, LDL low, and HDL high. Number four, one of the American Heart Association's Life Simple 7s is going to be C, reduced blood glucose. Number five, which food has saturated or trans fat? That's going to be C, pork belly. Pork belly is a very fatty cut of meat. And number six, what is the DASH diet? The DASH diet stands for C, dietary approach to stop hypertension. Number seven, how many minutes of aerobic activity per week is recommended for a heart healthy lifestyle? Our lucky number is B, 150 minutes. Number eight, an example of a heart healthy fat is going to be C. Remember all of those guacamoles we had in the sample menus? It's going to be C. Well, that's the end of our review, and we want to thank you guys for joining the Heart Health Promotion presentation today. This presentation was brought to you by the Stony Brook Medicine's Healthy Libraries Program. My name is Tina. Chris and Caitlin and I are available for any questions you have. All right, so now we would love to take any questions from you all. I'll just bring up your videos again. Cool. So please feel free to ask any questions about our presentation. And just remember that if you're asking a question, uh, go and unmute your uh, audio before you start talking. Question? Yes. I have a family history of high triglycerides. And I have heart disease genetically all through my family. And I do all the good stuff, but I'm at an age now that I really need to pay attention because diabetes also runs in the family. But my question is, what could I possibly eat? Is there anything I can eat to reduce triglycerides? Yeah, absolutely. So all of the things that we talked about with the DASH diet and uh, the American Heart Association Simple 7, mm -hmm. not only are they gonna help with cholesterol reduction and reducing your blood pressure, but they're also going to benefit your triglyceride levels as well. Um, remember back to that slide that talked about uh, the high and low uh, LDLs, HDLs, total cholesterol and triglycerides? Yes. So all of those tend to be linked. When your LDL goes up and your total goes up and triglycerides go up, that usually all happens together. Um, HDL is a little less uh, dependent on the other ones uh, because it is possible through uh, consuming more fiber and choosing uh, really, really high quality sources of omega-3 fatty acids to increase your HDL without necessarily increasing your uh, LDL. And remember HDL is that good cholesterol that we want to be trending upward. Correct. Um, what are your thoughts about taking omega-3 capsules? So as always, I think it's best to try to get everything, um, all of your nutrients through your diet. Yeah, but I don't like fish. <laughs> yeah, if, if it's difficult, and there are some other sources um, of omega-3s, such as flaxseed, uh, yes. olive oil as well, um, avocado oil, uh, in fact, just avocados like we talked about. So there are some ways that you can get omega-3s from your diet alone. Uh, but if you feel that you're still struggling to meet um, a higher amount of omega-3s throughout the day, and you'd like to increase that, um, you know, certainly supplementation is an option. Uh, I would encourage you, of course, to go talk with your doctor or healthcare provider about that first, just to make sure it 
won't have any issues with anything else that you're taking um, since, you know, I can't, can't recommend that you take anything. Uh, no, but the, the good news is I'm 65 years old and I don't take anything. Oh, well, that is fantastic. You know, because I was in one of those defensive driver classes and they said, who in here is not on medication? And I was the only person in the room. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I was like, really, people, you need to get your butt out of the chair and move. But no, thank you very much for that. Um, it, you know, you've told me pretty much what I've been told before, but I also know I have no control over genetics. So no, but remember, like we said, the genetics and those uncontrollable risk factors is absolutely not a life sentence. It's not a, That's oh, right. well, my whole family has it. So now I'm yeah. Yeah, there no, are well, things that we can do about it. And I think you you sound like a good example of that. Well, this morning I just did three miles up at West Meadow Beach and then I zoomed home so I can zoom with you. I mean, it was a gorgeous <laughs> day. Get out there, right? Well, but, I'm glad you were able to get on with us because you sound exactly great. like a living example of how you can have a family history and still still avoid it. Yes. All right. Thank you for your time. Of course. Thank you for joining us.